Dr. Barker is going to talk to us about uh, MitraClip uh, in 2018. So there actually are some updates in the MitraClip in 2018. So this is, this is going to be um, finally, I think, something new and different. Uh, first, I'll go through the U.S. experience based on the TVT registry data and then highlight two recent studies specifically targeting patients with functional MR and how to interpret the results given that they're somewhat conflicting. So as of now, for um, the percutaneous or transcatheter repair of mitral regurgitation, the mitral clip is the only commercially available device in the United States. There's a whole spectrum of potential devices in various stages of development and research. But as of now, this is the only thing we have in our, in our toolbox. It does provide good hemodynamics, and we can treat all kinds of mitral regurgitation. But as of today, it's only approved for the treatment of degenerative mitral regurgitation. So that's primarily who we've been treating. It does not require any long-term anti anticoagulation, and it does not disrupt the remainder of the mitral valve apparatus, as Dr. Lari has just shown the importance of the remainder of the, the apparatus. And in the rare case it doesn't work, we can always take it out, because we can evaluate the mitral clip's function real time with uh, TEE and determine whether or not it's is it inducing too much diastolic uh, gradient or is it too much residual MR. We can always just take it out and, and abort without causing too much harm. So this is what the system looks like. The delivery catheter um, is a 20 French transvenous system that goes uh, transeptal. The clip itself has actually uh, evolved a little bit. Now we have um, two different sizes. We, this uh, original sort of uh, smaller device is what we've been working with, uh, but now we've got a, a device that's uh, much longer with longer arms, uh, longer grippers, and this is, is sort of our go-to device now because it's enabled us, it makes the procedure much easier. We can do it frequently where we're using more than one clip. Now we're using primarily one clip because we have a big one. It's also facilitated um, tricuspid interventions uh, given the uh, longer uh, reach. So worldwide, there have been now over 50,000 uh, procedures done with a 97% success rate. And when we look at the US experience, this is the first uh, 3,000 patients that were reported in the TVT registry. You see an acute procedural success of 92% in hospital mortality of 2.7%. One year mortality of 25.8% and one year repeat heart failure hospitalizations of 20%. So, if you keep those numbers in mind, <clears throat> and these are primarily 85% 80, of these patients were degenerative mitral regurgitation, another 15 to 20% were functional. And Dr. Grayburn later this afternoon is going to go over the differences between functional and degenerative, so I won't. Uh, go into that now, but just remember these numbers because the two studies we're going to review are functional and they have different, different outcomes. The other thing we've learned from the TVT registry is the importance of um, concomitant tricuspid regurgitation. And because of this, people have started to target tricuspid regurgitation at the same time as treating mitral regurgitation. Specifically, you can see here, if you have greater than moderate uh, tricuspid regurgitation, you have a, a one-year uh, mortality of 35% after being treated. These are all people who were treated for their mitral regurgitation with a mitral clip who had residual severe tricuspid regurgitation that was not addressed. They have a, a very high mortality rate. In addition to the tricuspid regurgitation, the other important um, variable in determining someone's prognosis is how much mitral regurgitation you leave them with at the end of the procedure. Generally, we want to leave them with as little as possible, but as a rule of thumb, less than or equal to two plus is considered acceptable because that translates into meaningful clinical responses, meaning improvement in New York Heart Association classification, et cetera. And you can see that's consistent here in the TVT data, showing patients who were left with uh, three plus or greater mitral regurgitation had a significantly increased mortality, again, close to 40% as well as an increase in uh, death and rehospitalization approaching 50%. So we try to, um, we're, we're pretty aggressive and uh, compulsive about leaving as little mitral regurgitation as possible at the end of these procedures. <clears throat> 
Worldwide, um, most patients have had actually functional mitral regurgitation because in Europe, about 95% of patients treated have functional uh, mitral regurgitation. Whereas in the United States, as up until now, we were primarily only treating patients with degenerative mitral regurgitation. So two recent trials um, specifically addressed the impact that the mitral clip could have on functional uh, mitral regurgitation. The first study was a French study um, called the percutaneous repair with mitral clip for severe secondary MR. And this was, this was presented and published in um, August uh, as part of the European meetings. And the objective here was to evaluate the clinical efficacy of the uh, mitral clip to medical therapy in patients with heart failure and severe secondary MR versus medical therapy alone. Their secondary endpoint was a composite of death and unplanned rehospitalization for heart failure. So patients had to be symptomatic, have at least one hospitalization the year prior, had to have severe secondary MR, but was defined as an ERA of greater than 20 millimeters squared or a regurgitative volume of greater than 30, ejection fractions between 50 and 40 percent, and not eligible for uh, surgery. Um, this is, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but just some highlights here. Uh, these were a fairly sick population with multiple comorbidities, um, Euro scores of six, ejection fractions around 30, 33 percent. LVN diastolic volumes, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about this, but we're around 136 with ERO, EROs of 30 uh, millimeters squared. Um, the one interesting thing here, uh, which we'll compare to uh, the, the U.S. trial, is their periprocedural complication and pre-specified pre SAEs. They had a periprocedural complication rate of 14.6% which even when looking at our TVT data and then subsequently the COAP study is very high and a little bit unexpected and may have had some uh, impact on the results of this trial, which are shown here. So when looking at the Kaplan-Meier estimate of survival without a primary um, outcome event, you can see there is essentially no difference between the two groups. The mitral clip in this trial had no meaningful benefit or effect on treating patients with severe functional, some degree of severe functional MR, and it's a little bit debatable how severe it was in this trial, um, and versus medical therapy. So now, fast, oh, so they, they concluded that, yes, this could be done, but did it, did it affect the prognosis of the patients in this uh, population? No. So the, the, essentially the consensus here was this was a ventricular disease, doing something to the mitral valve is not effective. Now fast forward, um, about a month later in San Diego, uh, the U.S. trial, which is very similar um, with some caveats which I'll highlight, uh, was presented. So this is COAPT, which as you know, we participated in. We screened, <clears throat> as uh, Ash showed yesterday, we screened about 40 patients and ended up enrolling and randomizing 11. And, and as he showed, a lot, of those, a lot of the reason, 28 of those 40 patients, once they got optimized, um, with medical therapy actually fell out. They didn't have severe mitral regurgitation anymore. They didn't qualify for the trial. <clears throat> this was presented by uh, Greg Stone and Paul Grayburn, who will be here later, um, was one of the leaders of this trial. So here was the design. Um, it was a parallel controlled open label because one group's getting a clip and the other isn't. You couldn't be uh, double-blinded. Multi-center, about 600 patients with heart failure who had moderate to severe or severe secondary MR and remained symptomatic despite being on maximal, medical, uh, maximal medical therapy. So one to one randomization. You had to have, uh, you could have either ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but an ejection fraction between 20 and 25 percent with the left ventricular and systolic dimension of less than 70. You had to have moderate to severe or severe secondary MR confirmed by an independent echo core lab. So this was, this, this was another area where potentially people got ruled out because sometimes the mitral regurgitation was over or under uh, estimated. Had to be symptomatic and have a hospitalization for heart failure specifically within the prior year or a BNP greater than 300 or a, a pro-BNP greater than 1500 and you were not deemed um, a surgical candidate. People were excluded if they were beyond, if they were just too sick. They were end-stage heart failure and cardiogenic shock. 
they had uh, coronary disease that needed to be treated, lung disease that, or, um, that really would sort of cloud the outcomes as far as dyspnea, uh, pulmonary hypertension, other valvular diseases, or a mitral valve that was too small um, to allow a mitral clip to be uh, implanted. Um, these, there was a central core lab, again, so it's very objective review of these uh, echoes to make sure that they qualified. And there was also a very rigid um, central eligibility committee that once a week, and at Dr. Uh, Ashrith was the one who was on the phone usually for our team, uh, would have to present these patients. And there was primarily a surgeon and a heart failure specialist determining whether or not this uh, patient would qualify for COAPT. And many times the heart failure specialist will say, well, no, you can do A, B, and C, and D to the medical therapy. The surgeon a lot of times would say, well, I, this patient looks um, like a potential surgical candidate. So it was a very uh, rigid um, process uh, to get pe people into this trial. The primary endpoint um, for uh, effectiveness was all heart failure hospitalizations through two years. And the primary safety endpoint was freedom at one year for any device-related complications. Here's the baseline characteristics of the uh, two groups. Um, just, I think, a couple of highlights here. Again, um, sick population with multiple comorbidities. Um, but BNPs over 1,000, uh, STS scores for mitral valve replacements around eight in both groups. And so many were considered uh, high surgical risk. The um, other parameters, most of these were ischemics, which as we know are, are a sicker population in general. Most were NYHA class uh, two or three, about half qualified based on their hospitalization within the, pro having one hospitalization within the prior year, the other half qualified based on the um, pro-BNP or BNP levels. Um, their EROAs were 0.41, and their um, uh, the ejection fractions were around 30%. The medical therapy I won't go into, but was very stringent, really well optimized in, in our group as well as in others. This was done by d dedicated heart failure specialists who are experts in this and literally week to week titrate things by, by milligrams. And so a lot of people frankly did get better and, and not need this therapy. That being said, still 600 people got into the trial, 300 in each arm. And the primary effectivist endpoint, remember, was all hospitalizations for heart failure within two years. And so in the uh, medical therapy arm, there were 283 hospitalizations in 151 patients, as opposed to the medical therapy plus clip arm, there were only 160 hospitalizations uh, in uh, 92 patients at two years. So when you look at the annualized rates of heart failure hospitalization, in the medical therapy arm alone, it was 68%, as opposed to in the MitraClip plus medical therapy, it was 35%. And that calculates to a number needed to treat of only 3.1 patients. So that's fairly compelling. There's not a whole lot we do in medicine um, or surgery or anything, frankly, where we have a number needed to treat of, of 3.1 um, to prevent uh, an event. <clears throat> Regarding the safety of the procedure and the device, um, there was a pre-specified um, objective performance measure, and the uh, clip turned out to be exceedingly safe compared to what it was expected, and the device-related complications were only 3.4%. So much different, I think, than the uh, results we saw in Europe. Furthermore, every single um, power secondary endpoint was significant, and these weren't small things. These were uh, durability of the procedure, meaning at one year they're still less than or equal to 2 plus MR, mortality, death and heart failure hospitalization, quality of life, which has uh, become a very meaningful outcome, particularly in, in these patients. All-cause mortality, again, um, was uh, significantly improved when treated with the mitral clip. So at two years, all-cause mortality was 46.1% in the medically treated arm versus 29.1% uh, in the mitral clip plus medical therapy arm. Again, calculating a number needed to treat of only 5.9 patients. So again, very compelling um, from a uh, mortality as well as heart failure rehospitalization rate. 
Here's the quality of life data. So this KCQ is a quality of life questionnaire that all these patients get um, at various time points. And what you can see in dark and bl blue is the uh, medical therapy group, and in green was the mitroclip group. A meaningful change in the quality of life scale is five points. And the adjusted change you can see in the mitroclip plus medical therapy arm was 12.5 points. So that's significant, as opposed to the medical therapy treated arm who actually was doing worse from a quality of life perspective. Um, this is a little busy, but basically is showing the durability of the mitral clip that out to two years, most patients, 92 to 94 percent, still had less than or equal to two plus MR. So the conclusions of this trial were that in patients with heart failure and moderate to severe or severe secondary MR who remain symptomatic despite very well um, treated, maximally tolerated medical therapy, uh, the mitral clip was safe provided a durable reduction in MR, reduced the rate of heart failure hospitalizations, and improved survival, quality of life, and functional capacity during a 24-month follow-up. So therefore, this is the first therapy to show a significant improvement in um, the prognosis of patients in heart failure by reducing their secondary MR uh, um, as opposed to just medical therapy. So how do we now reconcile these two studies? I mean, they, they on, at first glance, they look very similar. I mean, they almost looked identical, but you get completely different results. Is it because maybe they're doing something different in France versus the US? Well, probably not. When you get under the surface a little bit more, it turns out there are some significant differences between the two studies. And, I th and it's sort of broken down into three criteria. One is the, 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 the disease state we were dealing with. Second was the medical therapy that was um, offered, and lastly, uh, some procedural issues. So when you look at the mitral FR uh, disease state compared to the COAPT patients, these were basically patients who had less MR but bigger ventricles, as opposed to in the COAPT, we had patients who had more MR and smaller ventricles. So here we might be treating a little bit subtle difference in, in patients' population here. The heart failure uh, medication um, regimens were very different in that, again, this was adjudicated by a screening committee in determining how, how aggressively and how appropriately had the patient been treated with uh, guideline-directed medical therapy. And because of that, I didn't show it, but there was very little change in the medical therapy over the 24 months in these patients because they had already been maxed out. As opposed to in um, mitral FR, the French study, they were still throughout the study getting significant changes in their medical therapy and therefore may not have ever been really um, optimized and they were not adjudicated or held accountable for having um, treated patients uh, aggressively. And then finally, regarding the procedural um, outcomes, again, in the mitral FR uh, study, there was a very high sort of failure rate of 9%, as well as residual greater than or equal to 3 plus MR of 9%, as opposed to 5% in the US trial. Again, the procedural complications, 14% in France versus 8% in the US, and the durability uh, strikingly different with um, greater than or equal to 3 plus MR of almost 20% in France and only 5% in the US. So I think when you, when you look at it, um, a little bit more carefully, there are pretty significant differences between the two trials. It's not just one was done in France and one was done in the U.S., but we still have to, we can't, I think, ignore both of them. We have to consider them both moving forward when we consider treating these patients. Thank you. That was great, Colin. Thank you much. Um,